Welcome to Portal Asset Management's monthly webinar. Portal seeks to bring you conversations with some of the leading digital asset creators, commentators, and regulators. It is a place to be inquisitive, questioning, and engaged. Portal's webinars are broadcast live and are then made available on all major podcast platforms. My name is Derek Graham, and I am the CEO of Portal Asset Management. And hosting the webinar is Mr. Mark Witten, CIO of Portal Asset Management. Please be aware that neither Portal, its guests, or listeners are providing financial advice. So hello, everyone. Good morning and good evening. Good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. And it's very relevant because if we look around our uh, guests today, they're in London, Switzerland, Australia, uh, both sides of the continent um, and the USA. So we've certainly we've got the globe well covered. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, we uh, enjoy doing our regular webinars here uh, at Portal Asset Management. One of the reasons is, is that we not just teach, but we learn. And the people we've got on tonight are typically of a high caliber. And I'll let Mark Witten, our CIO, introduce them shortly. Very briefly on the fund, we run two funds, Portal Asset Management. One fund is the Portal Digital Fund. And the Portal Digital Fund is now in its um, three, about three and a half years since inception. Uh, its performance has been uh, within its parameters and within our goal. Uh, we're up about 116% during that period of time. Our goal is to achieve around 30% per annum uh, net of fees. And uh, certainly we're likely to get to that, that number this 12 month period too. Uh, it's a fund of funds, around a third of those funds are in uh, long positions. Uh, so they're invested in funds that have got individual theses committed into the investment in the space. About a third of the funds are in high frequency trading and market neutral, and about a third of the funds are in momentum and sentiment trading. And that way we're in, our goal is to attain a volatility of somewhere between 20 to 25%. We also operate the Radiance Fund, and the Radiance is a direct investment token fund. Uh, we have uh, around 70% of that fund divided up into what we consider to be the best of each sector of the industry. We've divided the entire topography of the industry into 19 different sectors. And around 30% of that fund is in early stage tokens. And the Portal Digital Fund has been operating since July last year. And like so many of the funds now, you know, the, the industry now, um, we've seen uh, a superb turnaround in, that, in, the last, uh, in the last six month period of time. And that fund is up nearly 50% this, this, cal this calendar year so far. And it's operating within its, within its uh, volatility parameters. So two different volatilities for two different investment audiences. That's enough about that. Um, we always enjoy education. Uh, we do that um, every week through Beyond Bitcoin, Nitin Gao, who's on this call and myself. Uh, we do it on a quarterly basis, um, outlining our views of, of, uh, of the sector. And we have these great occasions to bring in audiences um, each webinar. Thank you very much indeed. And over to you, Mark. <clears throat> Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I'll just give you a brief introduction to our, to our guest speakers. We have uh, Michael Swenson and Nathan Montone, both founders of M31 Capital. Um, they've been both angel and VC investors, and uh, Michael operated as the chief offering, operating officer at Bridgewater. Apologies if I'm not speaking correctly. I've uh, just had a bit of an incident on the side of my face here. Um, so we, we'd love um, you know, what their thinking is and how they do their research and their portfolio construction and risk management. So we've we've been, um, you know, as, as a as a disclosure, we've been invested in their fund for almost a year and a half, two years now, um, and very, very happy with how they're positioned and, and their outlook, which they'll talk more about. We have back with us once again also Jamie Coots, who's a chartered market technician um, and used to head up, uh, was a crypto market analyst at Bloomberg's Intelligence. And, um, you know, Jamie, we've always liked his data-driven um, research and, and outlook and the fact that he was pioneering a lot of research on the Bloomberg platform. Um, he's now become an independent uh, consultant to the space, and we always enjoy his, his insights. And we're also joined by, you know, Derek's been introduced as our founder and CEO, and we have Nitin as well joining us from, from London as our chief technology officer and who heads up digital assets at, at State Street. 
So thanks very much for for joining, guys. I'm not going to spend um, you know very long at all and just kind of setting the scene is that we've you know we we believe that the market had bottomed at the end of of last year, beginning of this year, and we've been leaning into the market since the call it the middle of this year. Um, we we're pretty pleased with how we've been positioned. This last quarter is turning out to be a, a nice turnaround. And there's obviously a lot of macro factors affecting that, and we'll talk about it. But our three big calls, and and this was also in, in congruence with Jamie's research, was the continued debasement of fiat currency, which we're seeing. And if you saw the Argentinian peso was devalued, I think 40% a few days back. And then we're seeing, you know, this growth in institutional adoption, which is very important in terms of giving the industry more credibility as well as more participants and more liquidity. And then particularly why we like the, the you know, M31 as a fund is this confluence of AI, blockchain, and, and Web3. And we can see that as much as we, the, you know, crypto asset market gets a lot of flack and has been a very volatile market over the past two years. Once again, it's been the, you know, strongest performing asset class. However, we don't believe that this is, you know, that we've had our, our recovery and, and that the market is is pricing in where we're going in terms of both new participants because it's not just a cyclical you know market bounce that we're looking for here we're actually seeing what we believe is a secular bull market which is attracting a lot more participants a lot more institutional adoption and so on and importantly crypto is taking its place as a, a very much a, an asset class that provides good diversification benefits as the risk with macro and um, the correlation with macro and, and and with equities continues to fall and then finally i think just borrowing from Pantera's latest newsletter, we can see that if you look at the mean and reversion to mean is definitely one of the most powerful forces in the in the markets. We see that you know Bitcoin and the market itself are on track to to maintain the trend. Although I think the the rate of return might be flattening slightly, I still believe that we'll see a reversion to mean, and the markets tend to overshoot both to the the up and the downside in in both instances. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think. As you can tell, our overall outlook is is very bullish. And I think maybe just to to start off with you, Jamie, if there's anything I know that you wanted to, to potentially share some some data points. I think it's important that, you know, it's good to have opinions and good to have a view on the market. It's always important to be independent and objective. But what's even more important is to then, you know, have the research and the data that can also support that view and have these sort of mosaics in place, the pieces in place to to build that that picture. So yeah, over to you, Jamie. Is there anything you want to kind of run through? Yeah, so thanks very much, Mark, and to Derek and Nitin for the opportunity again here today. Um, what I thought I'd do is just share just a couple of slides that focus on the on-chain metrics, the underlying fundamentals of blockchains themselves, because there tends to be a lot of um a lot of focus on on price action. But underneath the surface, what we're seeing um in terms of adoption is very encouraging. So this is um, just a couple of data points from the Q3 um, State of the Crypto Ecosystem report that I that I do every quarter. And what's interesting, as, as of the third quarter, we had about 5 million daily active users using blockchains of the variety of uh, smart contract blockchains. So we're excluding here Bitcoin and some of the proof of work blockchains. And what we saw really over the the 2022 market was continual growth, irrespective of price action, what the values of these assets were, were doing at the time. We saw that in 2020 and 2021, we had the, you know, we had that massive bull run, which ended up peaking in November and then collapsing, depending on the asset, by anywhere between 75 to even 95% in those smart contract blockchains. However, what we saw was continual growth of around sort of 15 to 20 percent year on year from 2021 to 2023 and that's very encouraging that we're seeing adoption irrespective of um, asset prices now the other thing which i think is quite interesting is if you look at these assets as if they were a business and if you look at the revenue versus the expense line we're seeing a narrowing or a compression between revenues and ex and expenses in this case Revenues is the fees that are generated from users, um, you know, engaging with uh, any of the, the like the applications on these blockchains, and the expenses are typically um, the incentives that are paid to validators, so the inflation, 
And what we've seen, you know, primarily due to the fact that Ethereum has moved from proof of work to proof of stake and completely changed its tokenomics, but we have seen a scenario in which we're starting to get to sort of net uh, net profitability across the um, proof of blockchain, sorry, proof of stake blockchain segment, and that's also very encouraging. And then here, I did this. This chart here is interesting and just in terms of um, something that's a little bit different to the on-chain data, but the number of developers in the ecosystem. So we saw a, a drop off in 2022, uh, but the, the attrition really was actually not as bad as one would, would have thought uh, for two reasons. Number one, we obviously had a bear market. So if anyone was in that space thinking they could get rich quick, they would have um, most likely have left the space. And the other thing that happened during that period is that we had the really the, um, you know, the first iteration of major consumer AI applications, ChatGPT. So a lot of, um, there was a lot of pull into that space that may have actually drawn intellectual capital out of the crypto ecosystem. But what we saw is um, a pretty low attrition rate over that, over that period. And that's very encouraging because it is the intellectual capital in this space, which will ultimately drive the applications and the scaling solutions that it needs in order to, to meet sort of mainstream adoption. And then the last slide here is just a, a simple um, forecast, really a simple linear regression and um, forecasting um, model for daily active users for the next sort of five to seven years. And it's highly possible that we'll see daily active users currently around 5.2, 5.3 million get to about 100 million daily active users by the end of this decade. And that would obviously mean, um, you know, a significant uplift in prices because there is definitely a relationship between the number of users on these networks that are using them and the values for these assets. So Mark, that's it for me. I just wanted to share those um, data points before we kick off. No, thanks. Thanks, Jamie. I much appreciate it. Yeah, I think it pretty much does, does provide, you know, a, a solid underpin in terms of, the data and and what we're seeing, and I think, you know, when we spoke about the confluence of those three factors, I mean, you, you're seeing a lot more institutional involvement, but also a lot more operational robustness. I think a lot of the things that happened in 2022, and even this year in 23, there's it, it was very necessary for the industry, and and definitely, um, you know, definitely gave the industry more credibility in terms of the fact that it wasn't bailed out and managed to survive. So maybe turning to you, Nathan and 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 Michael as well, but. You know, how are you guys seeing things? How are you, you know, you you're obviously in, in the real the real weeds on and, and on the you know on the in the furnace there. How are you guys seeing things in terms of developments, new projects coming to markets? What are the areas that you're really excited about as we see the second order liquidity effect move from you know Bitcoin and Ethereum into the alts? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. Um there's, there's so much to dive into there on the like kind of the recap of 2022 and and then also what we're excited about going into uh, uh, 2024. I think on the, um, you know, just to touch on the kind of the learnings from from 2022, I, I think it was spot on. Kind of prices get, you know, they they get uh, excessive in both directions, right? And I think in 2022, a lot of the uh, the collapses that we saw, right, FTX and BlockFi, Voyager, Celsius, 3AC, the others, these were all centralized companies and centralized entities that failed for, you know, virtually all the, all the same reasons, you know, lack of transparency and, and, uh, and all of this. Uh, so I think one area that doesn't get the credit that it deserves was uh, the DeFi sector, the decentralized finance space where, you know, FTX collapsed. It was, it was, uh, it was opaque and it was run by humans, right? Whereas all of the decentralized exchanges that allow users to do exactly the same thing, swap one asset for another, are fully transparent and run by code and mathematics uh, and not humans. So the DeFi sector was a real, you know, a real highlight during all throughout the bear market. Of course, prices came down as they did across the board and even in the Web2 space. But uh, the DeFi sector really proved out over the last uh, couple of years why it needs to exist and why I think, uh, you know, all of the, uh, you know, the, the, the future of finance rests on kind of decentralized architecture, right? Because not a single DeFi user lost a single dollar to um, uh, to theft or to false advertising or to any of the you know the uh, the issues that plague the uh, the web two space uh, and so I think what we're starting to see or what we saw all throughout kind of 2023 is a repricing of uh, that reflects the real you know the strength of the decentralized uh, financial applications um, and so for us it, it really wasn't too 
uh, surprising to see how strong 2023 has turned out to be, you know, with Bitcoin up 150% and, you know, even greater price action from a lot of the, uh, uh, the alts in the DeFi space and, and in the Web3 space we, we can touch on. Uh, because like you said, prices sort of, they go extreme in both directions. So what we saw in 2022 is an unnecessary uh, over sell-off in the DeFi space in particular, which, uh, you know, sort of protected users where, you know, the SEC did not or where FTX or, or Web2 financial applications uh, did not. So for us, 2023 was, you know, just a repricing to, to reflect the strength of the, the DeFi and the Web3 space broadly. But I don't think it, it at all is the end of the end of the story here, you know, prices being up with Bitcoin up 150%, like you said, is really just exactly in line with its long run annual average. Uh, and that doesn't, you know, take into account any of the uh, insane amount of exciting things that are in store for Bitcoin specifically going into 2024, like the halving and the ETF and, and a lot of the Bitcoin specific uh, catalysts, as well as, you know, more interesting things and net new innovations like modular blockchains and zero knowledge proofs and uh, and the decentralized physical infrastructure network space that's taking off uh, and we can get into you know any of those but there's uh, you know kind of remarkable to us is the, the the enormous number of powerful catalysts that are all lining up exactly in the same in the same direction in favor of Bitcoin and the crypto space but all exactly aligned uh, with uh, almost down to the same month in 2024 uh, with the having coming in April 2024 and and the Bitcoin ETF uh, looking like it'll be approved sometime around early January, um, if not by the March deadline. So very, very, you know, uh, similar timings on some of the strongest catalysts that I think Bitcoin has seen in its 15 year history. Yeah, yeah I, would, yeah, I would agree. Sorry, did someone want to? Yeah, Mark, maybe if I, um, again, not to, not to replay 2022 too much, but I think, you know, yep. Nathan kind of articulated, you know, some of the value drivers, the decentralized finance that we saw last year kind of, you know, get accelerating, get elevated during some of the carnage that we saw. I think it's also what, what we experienced was this divergence of uh, funds like M31 Capital that have spent a lot of time and effort and focus on operational risk management mm -hmm. and putting that effort in since day one uh, and being truly, honestly ready for institutional adoption and funds that were not. And so, you know, when I left Bridgewater back in 2019 timeframe to kind of launch M31 Capital with Nathan, uh, we, we've always refused to kind of compromise on those core operational security best practices and operational risk practices. And because, and I think 2022 really kind of provided us the biggest validation of that decision. Not only did we avoid all the, the, the carnage that happened last year, but we also positioned ourselves for success heading into 2023 and the next decade going forward, right? As industry leaders with best in class operations. And so I think we, we saw both uh, sector like de decentralized finance get elevated and uh, um, uh, more attention bringing it into the value drivers of DeFi. And then we also saw this divergence of funds that are truly institutional, operationally ready, and those that were not, that are no longer here. No, I think it's, it's music, music to my ears, Malcolm, music to my ears. I think it's, it's yeah, it's it's very important because just to, to stay on this for one second, you know, what a lot of people haven't, I don't want to say, kind of realized is that the initial dot-com bubble created the infrastructure, created the plumbing of the internet. It was mostly in hardware, right? And fiber optics and things like that. And when that collapsed, no one was thinking about the YouTubes and the 10 cents and the gaming and all the applications that would be built on the internet. And Nitin kind of explained this to me a while back, how the internet's a thin protocol. It was built on top, created the wealth. It's the same with the blockchain. But a lot of people are starting to figure out now in terms of tokenization, NFTs, but the plumbing needed to be secure. The plumbing needed to be laid. And I'm sure, like me, when you started looking at the space properly 2018, 2019, you realized that there was a lot of lack in, in robustness. There was maybe fidelity in one or two others, but you didn't have you know, proper custody, proper counterparty risk management and that sort of thing. And I think 2022 exposed that to an extent, but it in fact showed also who was playing the game properly. It showed you know, the coin spots, and the Krakens and even the Binances, as well as the, the funds that managed that risk properly. So I think the plumbing to me has been laid now, the foundation, which is more, it feels like it's been built more on rock this time. And I think you would agree that the next wave of capital that comes in, which is institutional, is a lot larger than what we'd be used to. There are fewer participants now that are actually able to absorb that and manage it properly. 
Isn't that any, if, if maybe, sorry, sorry, Michael, you were going to gonna add to that? No, I just 100% agree with you, Mark. I think, uh, you know, building that foundation and having that solid foundation, you know, battle tested over the last uh, year, 18 months, uh, really is going to be the thing that enables these large institutions where I've spent two decades of my career to actually feel comfortable to kind of re-architect their mandates and to make real investments into the space. And we're starting to see those already with the ETF approvals coming and some of the institutions like BlackRock and Fidelity and Goldman's of the world, you know, getting their teams organized on, you know, how they want to participate in the space. And uh, I think it's, it's less of, um, you know, if they want to, it's, it's, they need to, right. And, and trying to figure out exactly how they, they integrate into these systems and, and leverage these technologies for, uh, for their own benefit and for their clients' benefits. Yeah. And I would, Absolutely. I would just even on the uh, uh, on the investment side too, so you know the, the 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 focus has been on infrastructure and and ensuring that the space has the right infrastructure to to scale and and be run you know in a in a professional and institutional grade way. But even on the investment side, you know the focus has been on infrastructure so far. So you know our early investments were all and all the all the major winners in the in the space so far have been you know infrastructure plays. You know either blockchain as a ledger or you know Filecoin or or are we or live peer a lot of the core infrastructure that supports a decentralized internet like de like you said sort of the plumbing of the internet decentralized bandwidth and compute and so we really are kind of playing that same that same story from you know the early internet or the web 1 or web 2 era starting with that core infrastructure like decentralized you know indexing protocols uh, and what we're what we're started what we started to see last year uh really for the first time was you know decentralized consumer facing applications you know apps, decentralized apps that people can use and run on their phones. And, you know, we're starting to get, you know, closer towards the, you know, I want to say real world working use cases of, of blockchain tech with real users, you know, paying for, uh, you know, a real solution to a real problem. Um, and so just, it's, it's just, it's always funny how it's following kind of that same uh, trajectory as uh, the early internet, starting with build, the build out of the core infrastructure and then the build out of uh, the consumer apps on top. And that's, that's sort of where m wants focus has uh, has traced as well. We started with our early investments being mostly core, you know, inter uh, internet infrastructure, you know, decentralized protocols that uh, support, you know, a, a user-owned internet. And then uh, now we're starting to see more and more examples of, you know, things like Helium or Teleport, decentralized ride sharing or decentralized Twitter, decentralized social media type applications that are leveraging that core infrastructure to build, uh, you know, really interesting decentralized user-owned uh, and user-facing applications on top. And so it's sort of reflected in our, in our, uh, you know, uh, portfolio as well. So one question, Nathan, on, on your deep end, uh, and, and I've been looking at deep end for quite some time. These are very capital intensive, uh, you know, investments for them to be able to have the same infrastructure. If we aspire to build this sort of super secure sort of infrastructure that's needed for, for blockchain applications. And I have looked into this both in terms of the fact that evolution of internet and the early days investment that's going into the, the, the underlying infrastructure, this is interconnect compute, and and uh, the overall networking that that uh, you know, that was needed, as opposed to where we are today. How do you view this? From are you is the lens from the tokenomics of decentralization, or is the lens coming in from um, your overall sort of VC like models, which allows you to be be able to provide a valuation vehicle for some of these entities? Uh, and I'm asking this because I think. I believe that there's a lot of investment going into building, for example, the Alchemix and block teams of the world are, the, to me, the next generation Web3 cloud infrastructures, which will need that level of gravity of the a perfect storm of computing that, that's needed for blockchain per se. And until that happens, a lot of these protocols that are relying upon the underlying security, I think will fall short at some point. And so I subscribe to your thinking uh, wholeheartedly. Just want to get your uh, lens in terms of how you look at this from a valuation and growth perspective. Yeah, I think I think there's kind of two parts in that question. You know, one is sort of the benefits of decentralizing some of this physical infrastructure, and and really where is where does blockchain technology you know fit in as a solution here that does something beyond what Web two you know and centralized platforms are able to offer. And then second is sort of the valuation uh, framework piece of this uh, kind of you know uh, value accrual and rev share to the users and and ultimately who's supporting it. <laughs> I think on the you know part one of that the the core benefit or one of the major benefits I see of decentralizing a lot of the you know core infrastructure, you know, deep in decentralized physical infrastructure networks, uh, things like decentralized wireless networks is the tokenization element. So 
essentially by incentivizing users with a token to go out and do the work, they're, they're effectively acting as your employees, right? So rather than a centralized company, which has a finite number of employees, and they're trying to bite off, you know, the whole world, they're trying to cover the whole world in, um, you know, let's say a, a wireless network or 5G applications or, or something like this. Instead, you can have uh, you can have a token that incentivizes the users to go out there in the world and plug in hotspots, like in the case with Helium, where Helium was able to kind of bootstrap a network that that rivals AT and T and Verizon and and T Mobile in a fraction of the time. In something like eighteen months, they were able to get to the same you know global coverage and scale. One hundred and eighty eight countries, you know, a million hotspots, you know, worldwide covering basically every country. Um, in in you know like in eighteen months or something like this, very close to that. Uh, and th that would not have been achievable if they had run it as a centralized company that had to go, you know, state by state, town by town, negotiate, you know, telco contracts or land leases with uh, with every single, you know, local uh, jurisdiction uh, across the planet. Right. I mean, it, number one, it's the capital constraint. You'd have to go out and step one, raise billions, like tens and tens of billions of dollars uh, to run this strategy. And then step two just the resources and the time consuming and the energy, you'd have to go, you know, like I said, town by town and, and negotiate these things. So instead they, they took a completely opposite route. They said, let's use a token to incentivize the users to go out there and wherever they're currently sitting, just plug in a hotspot. And now we have coverage in that, in that space. So they were able to rapid scale uh, the network and build out this global, you know, decentralized wireless infrastructure network uh, in just 18 months. So that model has proven really effective. There were a lot of learnings on the, on the Helium side and the token economics Front, but now you're seeing more projects mimic that model, um, and others like Wi-Fi Map are out there doing the same thing. You know, leveraging a token. So I think that tokenization element uh, is is not going away. That that was a huge catalyst, and uh, you see this now. You know, I, I don't want to go too deep into the AI, the Web three AI space. It's sort of a separate topic, but happy to discuss here. But it, it's a very similar similar benefit there, where if you tokenize. If you if you tokenize the the, the structure, you, you have an incentive for the users to contribute the compute or the data resources uh, necessary to train or run the the LLMs, uh, which is just not not feasible. If you try to run you know a centralized competitor to OpenAI right now, you need to burn something like a hundred million dollars or more per month to train a new AI model. Versus you know bringing that compute cost way down by uh, a token incentive that gets users to sort of lease out their idle. CPUs and GPUs from their phones and and their iPads uh, to this global you know decentralized compute network. Uh, so sort of a you know long winded answer to that uh, first part of that question, but I think the the huge benefit here in decentralized physical infrastructure networks was that the unlock of using a token to incentivize millions of users to become the employees of your company or your network rather than you know running it as a centralized company with a finite number of employees trying to bootstrap. Thanks, Nathan. Jamie, you you wrote a report recently um, for for real value, um, real vision. Sorry, <laughs> real value. Yeah. And, and you know, you said there's the sort of some of the top five um, blockchain adoption drivers were, and I quote, it was you know payments, um, account abstraction, real world assets in terms of tokenization, NFTs and gaming and AI, which which dovetails quite nicely with this. Um, I think it would be it would be great if we can you know I'm not sure of your restrictions but if you could share that report with the guys it would also be it would also be good, but I think um, you know going into or dovetailing with what um, you know Nathan and, and and Michael have said, I mean from from your perspective, if you had to pick one of those, what would you say? And I, and I'm you know there's obviously overlap between them, but if you had to kind of take a a, a view as to where you would focus your time going forward, you know what would be the the, the the area that you think is going to be showing some of the most promise and growth out of those adoption drivers? Um, I think the one that probably has the most amount of upside is this sort of, I think, the AI space um, and what it actually means for, for blockchain adoption. Um, so I've really only just started to scratch the surface. But, I mean, there, there are sort of easier plays in the space, which would be, sort of looking at the um, what's going to happen with the amount of scaling or the degree of scaling that you now see in ecosystems like Solana and what that should mean for corporates in terms of NFT issuance and integration of, of Web3 into corporate strategies. But I think the AI aspect is immensely inter interesting. Um, I haven't looked at the sort of the portfolio assets um, in the same way as Michael and Nathan obviously have and have actually 
um, you know, been involved in these protocols from very early on. But I'm, I'm, I tend to look at things from the infrastructure layer perspective and what it could potentially mean in terms of the number of users in the in the ecosystem. So the Real Vision report that I think you're referring to um, built in a, a model which looked at AIs or AI agents becoming active on blockchains within the next sort of two to three years and what that could mean for the number of effectively users, um, irrespective of whether it's humans or AI and what that potentially could mean in terms of fees and valuations. So just I, I know that, um, you know, Nathan pointed out um, the potential now within the protocol layer rather than the infrastructure layer, which was the focus of the first maybe the first iteration or the first generation of sort of blockchain investing. Um, but there's going to be an immense amount of um, you know, potential upside in fee generation if AI does become active on blockchains. Um, and that really just, just starts to blow out the numbers in terms of those daily active user counts and, and potential valuations for layer ones and layer twos. Yeah, no, hundred percent agree. It's the um the deep dive, the roadmap to hundred million crypto users is that report, um that I saw, and there were some really interesting graphics, um particularly when you you do consider, as I said earlier, that we're not quite certain in terms of what applications are still going to be built, um you know, and and some of the areas that haven't really been opened up because it's one thing to have a thesis and go, well, it's AI, it's gaming, but it's how do you monetize that, and who is going to monetize that? And I think that's where the risk comes. That's where you know, proper portfolio management or being skilled as being able to pick out, you know, the next Solana. That's kind of like, you know, what what the purpose of, of, of all this research and all this work is in terms of monetizing it. I just want to open it up to the to the audience. And if there's any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, if there's any comments, please feel free to to unmute and unmic. Having a bit of a battle here trying to figure out how to spotlight just the speaker. It seems to be only allowing me to spotlight individuals one at a time. So I'll just unspotlight all. Uh, maybe maybe I could just touch on that uh, that last point Jimmy made because it's a fun topic here on AI agents, right? We saw with the last uh, the Open AI um, their um, not their demo day but their developer day, uh, they were talking about this. They launched GPTs, you know, autonomous AI agents, effectively that can be out there and you know thinking and learning and transacting and you know effectively running businesses, you know, completely on an automated fashion. It becomes immediately obvious, I think, that they're not going to be using you know little pieces of you know, dirty green paper to transact and do business as they get you know, increasingly relied upon for, uh, you know, transactions online and, and all of that, um, these autonomous agents. So what are they going to use? It seems, it seems pretty clear. It's going to be a digital form of mm. money. It's going to be the money that was made for machines like Bitcoin, uh, something that, that runs 24 seven, 365, that doesn't have, you know, kind of these, you know, you know, it doesn't stop on the weekends. It doesn't, you know, I don't know, have all these artificial restrictions and geographic limitations and, and frictions and uh, uh, with sending sending funds and paying fees and all that. So I think um, I think the interesting component there is going to be as as we increasingly rely on AI agents to you know autonomously run portions of our business and transact between each other. Even uh, they have to pay for you know a the compute necessary and, uh, to keep themselves alive to run themselves, but also you know if we put them to work in the market, a trading AI. I mean, as a very simple example. Um, they're not going to be plugged into a, a bank account that requires, you know, wetware signatures and all that. It's going to be completely, you know, autonomous agents using the money that was created for machines. So I think Bitcoin is going to be a, is going to have a serious role to play. It's not going to be, you know, any kind of tier two, you know, currency that has, you know, weaker security guarantees. So it's a. So it's we don't different. need we don't need Swift anymore. Yeah, we well we haven't for we haven't since two thousand and nine. Yeah. We haven't since <laughs> So I, I think people need to get their head around exactly what impact artificial intelligence might have on the pure volume of transactions that can occur, uh, that'll need to occur at speed and need to be recorded on, on blockchain equivalent environments. I've had that sense of experience because I'm involved with a side project that uh, is a passion project with some friends. And, uh, and it was using artificial intelligence to, and to, 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 um, uh, visit sites, accumulate information, um, bring that information to the forefront in a manner that it understood the information, it could understand what the images were, it could understand, et cetera, and then could formulate that in a manner of which you could then search it upon, yada, yada. But the point was, I could spend a day 
uh, and in that day I might expend a dollar in in data visiting. Um, however, when ChatGPT unleashed its power and started going through this, we were spending two hundred dollars a day um, on a constant basis in ChatGPT fees, and then that was halved and it increased the amount of money we spent because we were going faster to achieve what we needed to do. So in fact, uh, I think the, the, the uh, intellectual property um, that, that, um, that artificial intelligence leverages by virtue of the pure volume of transactions is going to see enormous amounts of, well, wealth created in, in these transactions that they'll do. Uh, so that's a, as an observation from my uh, immediate experience. I am so delighted that we're actually talking about leveraging artificial intelligence about Web 3.0. Uh, we're again talking about helium and establishing infrastructure. We're again talking about um, globalizing um, uh, computational power and, uh, and storage. But it's intriguing to see that a big part of the increase in price, and as my friend Nitin always says, price is what you pay, value is what you receive, but price of the tokens has increased because traditionally ETF and institutional investors are, are, are touted to be arriving. How ironic isn't that we're that the price has increased because traditional investment structures um, have have come on, and and I noticed that that it's it suggested that uh, Block Tower um, is now the third largest holder of um, sorry BlackRock is now the third largest holder of Bitcoin in the world at 118,000 tokens. It says. So they've certainly been squirreling away those tokens right through 2022, um, preparing for this environment. Do you think we'll get to a point where, um, where the world of crypto um, will start consuming the world of traditional investment by tokenizing it? And how long do you think it's going to take us to start really considering that this tokenization world is, is the most logical way to do transactions versus transporting US dollar foldable bills across the world in the back of airplanes. Yeah, well, I, I'll, I mean, I'll take the, the lead on that one. Um, I definitely believe that's a, that's the future of finance. I bet my entire career on it and, uh, and reputation as the entire point of M31 Capital. So it, it is simply when you understand decentralized finance, it's just it's just better across virtually every dimension. It is faster, it's cheaper, it has a stronger user experience, user interface. It's 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 just this remarkable, you know, 100x or more uh, improvement on the existing, you know, financial uh, infrastructure and all the frictions that that come with that. And I think, you know, we're going to look back uh, on our current uh, financial infrastructure as just completely archaic compared to what, not what will exist in the future, what currently exists, right? And I touched a bit on it in the beginning with uh, how strong DeFi decentralized finance applications performed compared to centralized financial applications like FTX and BlockFi and Celsius Voyager. And it really is just that same story in financial history over and over and over, right? Centralization and opacity and excessive risk taking under the hood that no one can see because it's not transparent and these permission walled gardens that, that lead to, you know, kind of these pathologies that build inside institutions that no one sees until they collapse and it's it's too late. What I love about the decentralized financial world is that it prevents these catastrophes from happening in advance, right? So even the SEC waits until after FTX explodes to then say, oh, you shouldn't have done that, right? But code-based finance prevents you from sending money to the wrong place in the in the first place, right? So if, if someone had, you know, uh, paying the contract call to Uniswap, a decentralized exchange and said, send all these user funds to my personal bank account, the code would not let it happen in the first place. So it, it, it puts a physical you know, sort of restraint on, on you know, the ability of bad actors uh, in this space. So it's absolutely the direction that, that the financial markets should head. It's definitely the financial, it's the direction that they are heading. You saw yesterday Coinbase announced Project Diamond, which is you know a, a, an effort to tokenize real world assets. You've seen like Franklin Templeton and some others put T-bills, treasury bills, on uh, uh, on on chain, you're seeing uh, that RWA category, real world assets, um, emerge. You know, in a very strong way because, I mean, purely just for the efficiency gains and uh, and the fee reductions and and the, uh, the the overhead reductions that that you get from putting uh, financial assets on chain. So that that I mean, that's just the security element alone is is a sufficient reason to migrate the uh, you know 
the the revenue opportunity and the efficiency gains are are just you know several others, but it's the direction that we're heading and we'll continue to head in. Mark, I noticed we've got quite a few um, questions coming up there. Would you mm. like to read those out? Sure. Uh, from Lewis, um, can Michael and Nathan talk briefly about their views on Celestia? It's an M31 portfolio company. He thinks the modularity thesis is one that should be on people's radar. When, you know, there's any comments? Uh, sorry, just had to plug in my computer. Uh, the question was around... Uh, um, Celestia, yep. The Celestia, another uh, another kind of technical uh, improvement or a new innovation in the crypto space uh, that we're seeing for the first time, which is modular blockchains. So, you know, I could probably... Uh, I could probably talk about this for another couple hours, but you know, up until now, we've lived in this paradigm of monolithic blockchains, meaning that Ethereum is everything. You know, it is it is the data availability layer, it's the consensus mechanism, it's it's every single app is all reliant on the same chain. So if there's someone, you know, on the other side of the world doing a big NFT mint, right, then you won't be able to, it'll be more expensive for you to get your Uniswap transaction through, right? Trading one asset for another. It, you know, really shouldn't be more expensive or or held up because someone else on the other side of the world is doing something with NFTs, right? Uh, so we're, we're excited about the modularity thesis because by sort of tranching out the different mm, components of what a blockchain does, which is, you know, essentially like come to agreement on the state of the chain and then a, con a consensus uh, mechanism for that and then an execution environment that uh, that says what is allowed to happen or not allowed to happen when someone, you know, submits a transaction. <laughs> so what yeah i mean uh, i don't know where to sort of uh uh how, how to kind of truncate my uh excitement on the modularity thesis but celestia is kind of the forerunner in this space it's the first example of a modular blockchain that'll allow anyone to spin up you know a new chain a new app chain uh leveraging you know let's say the you know security environment from ethereum plus the execution environment from solana um and so we're just going to see this you know similar to the impact uh, Ethereum had on what was up until then only really the the Bitcoin space. Mm. Uh, we're going to see that same sort of uh, explosion of new use cases that uh, you know have been so far unimaginable. Uh, when it be when it becomes as easy for anyone in the world to kind of you know um, drag and drop the best parts of each blockchain to create you know brand new brand new modular uh, um, use cases. Hey, so I have a question for all three of you, Michael, Nathan, and Jamie. And again, this has been a fascinating conversation. So thank you for your inputs and your perspectives. So if you look at the ETF and RWA, which is the institutional entry point and embracing of this technology and eventually trying to leverage the technology for tokenization of real world assets and looking into traditional finance and moving towards that direction for transaction purposes. And then we look into... Again, during the lull, we had a lot of tourism that was over, a lot of building that happened. Celestia is a perfect example, and dynamism, and many of the other projects who come up, you know, come along. The entire premise of that was to be able to encourage the hundred billion usage and eventually going after a billion users, which increases utility. And all the numbers that Jamie discussed should be exponentially higher when every year we discuss this. If if we're doing the right things from the industry perspective, so if you were to take the entire, again, the space is quite crowded. You have a lot of protocols trying to do a lot of different things. If, in your opinion, if you were to distill down, and I know it's a Herculean task because I've tried to do that, it's it's been incredibly hard to be able to pinpoint and figure out of the two or three different sort of pillars that the entire industry rests upon, which are the foundational sort of framework that I've always tried you know tried to achieve to to you know to come to. How would you distill the entire sort of convergence of this you know impact? of the institutional entry into the space, as well as all the newer projects who are built upon that ecosystem, including the older projects who have achieved some level of success. And it's a loaded question, but I'll pause here to see if, if that even made sense. But love to get your perspective on how to distill that down into the industri industry imperatives, so to speak. Yeah, there's a lot of, I think, I think there's like 10 questions packed into that, into that, <laughs> <laughs> that one question. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll remember yet. To address each one of them, but the um, yeah, I think yeah. the ETF is a huge milestone for the uh, for the industry. It's huge validation for you know the asset class. You know, we, we've always kind of joked that they 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 would never approve you know a heroin futures ETF or something, right? So saying you know giving this kind of approval for a Bitcoin ETF 
and then what will be an Ethereum ETF and a Solana ETF, and it just paves the way for you know regulatory approval for um for a lot of these things to go mainstream and get institutional adoption. Uh, it, it really is kind of a, a major milestone for the industry, and uh, and it's going to come with a, a gigantic marketing campaign. So this is getting talked about more and more now, but you know just a handful of of uh, you know, large institutional players that have applied for a Bitcoin ETF so far managed something like 15, 16 trillion dollars in AUM, right? So, I mean, really just, you know, 1% of that flowing in is, is uh, and it's sort of a winner take all market as well. So if we're talking, you know, if we're talking about an ETF that will probably garner something like a 1% fee, you know, it, it should be, you know, it's a, it's a billion dollar a year annually opportunity for whoever kind of the the leader in that, uh, in the, in the, you know, Bitcoin ETF or the, and that's just one, that's just the one Bitcoin ETF for one asset. It's one, one ETF for one asset, you know, in, uh, uh, for one player annually. So it's a huge, huge revenue opportunity for whoever kind of takes the lead on that. And so there's more conversation now. I think, uh, a lot of people are talking about the, the big, the biggest marketing blitz in, uh, in, in financial market history, right? Cause people will, every player, on earth will be vying for that, you know, billion dollar annual revenue opportunity. Uh, and so you're going to start seeing all throughout next year. I mean, you'll probably start seeing it now in advance of the, the January uh, approval. Um, every asset manager on earth pushing for uh, Bitcoin, pushing for Bitcoin, why users, why their um, customers need to own or have some exposure to Bitcoin. It's, I think we're on the cusp of, you know, the biggest marketing blitz in, in financial market history. Uh, and it's going to start with the Bitcoin ETF. And then once that, once Bitcoin as always has sort of broken the ice, uh, immediately, and we've already seen uh, applications for an Ethereum ETF, and I, I don't see any reason why we won't immediately after see you know applications for a Solana ETF and uh, you know a Web3 index and a DeFi index, and uh, it'll it'll continue from there. So as always, it sort of starts with Bitcoin, you know, and then it'll trickle down through the rest of the the industry. And I I think a, you know a big opportunity here is as is as always front running that opportunity by going to the highest quality assets in the Web3 and in the DeFi. Uh, sector that will benefit from, you know, the this increased validation of the asset class, increased usage, you know, and whether it's AI agents or, uh, like I mentioned at the beginning, you know, everyday consumers, you know, finally having a suite of uh, Web three products that they can use on their phones. So yeah, but I think I probably you see they're finally coming around to to some logical thinking. It's taken a while for the so called sophisticated crowd to catch on to this relatively unsophisticated fact of where the market's heading.